In the next part of this section of the lecture, I want to turn to the other crisis, which is the Asian um, financial crisis. And so to begin just with um, a, a, a note, an overview note, I've taken this quote from Takatoshi Ito, who said that Japan's experience, by which he's talking about Japan's experience um, in um, the 1980s, Japan's experience warns that the possibility of a financial bubble increases as the economic growth rate um, picks up. Now, Ito wrote his article about the Japanese economic experience before the Asian financial crisis happened. So we can think of these words as being um, somewhat um, prescient. Uh, because, in fact, the story that he's telling here of a financial, a type of financial um, bubble occurring um, as economic growth picks up is a key factor in understanding what happened in the Asian um, financial crisis. Uh, basically, this is a crisis that began with the collapse in value of the Thai baht and then spread um, after adversely affecting the entire economy to have major adverse effects on Malaysia, Indonesia and South Korea. So in other words, four of the high performing Asian economies adversely affected during this um, episode. How did the asset price, pro asset price bubble happen? Well, essentially the strength of macro performance of these high performing uh, economies had caused high levels of capital inflows. So, International investors had seen these economies as attractive places to invest because of the high rates of economic development. Um, the capital inflows took the form of foreign direct investment by businesses in those countries, equity investment in shares of um, uh, domestic companies, but also short-term bi borrowing by banks in those countries. Um, and that short-term borrowing by banks, um, particularly important because of its volatility, because it's easy um, for um, uh, lenders who've loaned the money to the banks in those um, in the countries, Thailand, South Korea, for example, to withdraw um, those funds. So, so there was a lot of capital inflow to these economies, but some of it, in particular in some of the countries, a large proportion of it was quite easy to easy to withdraw. So it created a source of volatility in the in the economy. The other thing that happened is that as the, the amounts of capital inflow to these um, countries increased, increasingly that capital inflow was misallocated in terms of where it was in invested. Um, so um, for example, as we saw in the case of Japan, um, increasing it allocated towards real estate, causing bubble in real estate prices, um, also allocated towards poor quality public and private um, investment, um, investment projects. Um, and so eventually the, 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 the revelation that um, these um, funds are being misinvested, that by being invested in real estate, by being invested in poor quality investment projects, they're not going to earn a, a rate of return that was as high as investors thought. That leads investors to withdraw their capital. So you get investment projects starting to fail, that leads investors to withdraw their capital. They can do that relatively quickly, especially where they've got um, funds invested through short-term lending to, to banks. Second factor that happens, and, 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 and a particular reason with regard to Thailand where the crisis starts, is that the international trade position of these economies um, starts to worsen. So the Japanese government um, undertakes a major depreciation of the value of the yen in the mid-1990s. That makes Japanese manufactured products much cheaper relative to manufactured products in Thailand and um, South Korea, um, for example. And so that means that there's a big decrease in demand for exports from places like Thailand, uh, South Korea, because of this um, relative adjustment in, in prices between Japan and these other competing Asian economies. Um, so in Thailand in particular, big collapse in the growth rate of exports causes a large current account, a large current account um, deficit. Um, so there's a, an international, there's a, there's a balance, of, there's a current account um, problem in, in Thailand. Now, an important point about um, in the, the Thai economy, but these other economies at this time, which I'm mentioning for the first time now, is that they had a, a fixed exchange rate, a fixed exchange rate. Um, and so that means that when you get withdrawal of capital, such as in the first dot point here, 
That means when you get um, a, 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 a current account deficit um, developing, that to maintain the fixed exchange rate, the, the Thai, um, Thai central bank has to do that by um, running down um, international, the international um, uh, foreign reserves that um, Thailand, Thailand had. Um, Thailand, um, in, in order to try and um, offset the effect of the adverse effect on the domestic economy of um, withdrawal of capital, seeks to uh, uh, stimulate um, the economy. But that has the um, spillover effect of actually um, e e then um, accelerating the depletion of foreign um, reserves. And so a situation develops where um, international currency speculators begin to believe that um, Thailand does not have sufficient um, foreign reserves in order to be able to maintain a fixed exchange rate and that it won't be able to take other um, policy um, steps that can um, uh, restore a situation where it can both maintain a fixed exchange rate and not be um, increasingly sending its foreign reserves um, uh, 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 offshore. Um, so speculators basically begin to uh, uh, bet um, that um, the, the, the Thai government will have to um, devalue the exchange rate. So the way they do that is they start withdrawing um, foreign reserves with the idea that um, if you withdraw now, you'll be able to put money back into Thailand at a much more favourable exchange rate after Thailand has devalued it, its exchange rate. So. The story is basically the, the first two dot points mean that in order to maintain a fixed exchange rate, um, Thai policymakers have to um, reduce their foreign reserves. That happens on a scale such that international currency speculators believe that Thailand may have to devalue its exchange rate. How do they speculate against the Thai currency? Well, they do that by taking more capital out of um, Thailand because by doing that it means they can take it out when the Thai currency is, is valued at a higher amount and then they can go back when they can buy the Thai currency at a much cheaper rate. But of course what that does is that just accelerates the process of the depletion of foreign reserves and, and eventually the process of speculative capital flows means that the Thai government is forced to adopt flexible exchange rate and devalue the baht. So in 1997 that happens, they devalue from um, 26 baht per US dollar to um, 47 baht uh, per US dollar. Um, so just making the point about the speculators, um, when they went out of the Thai currency, they need 26 baht to buy one US dollar. When they go back in, they can buy 47 baht with that US dollar. So they've almost earned a double return by the speculation on the Thai government devaluing. In the other countries affected, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Korea, there's a similar story of structural weakness that ends up causing currency crises with the timing of those crises basically it seems being determined by um, the BART decline having um, occurred. Now the problem for all of these economies is that they've now all significantly depreciated their currencies um, and, and that's a problem because Banks in each of those countries, to differing degrees, have, have borrowed amounts that are denominated in, in US dollars. So for example, if you've borrowed one dollar US in Thailand before the depreciation you needed 26 baht to pay that back, after the depreciation you need 47 baht um, to pay that back. So that means banks now, the, the value of their debts to international lenders is significantly, is significantly increased. So that means the banking system in these countries um, has an impaired capacity to um, fund investment. Um, there's a negative wealth effect um, throughout those economies um, um, from the, the, the value um, of, for example, um, uh, assets, um, bank assets would be one example, and there's a generally um, impaired functioning of the banking sector, all of which adds up to a decrease in aggregate demand and a recession in those um, countries. Now there are different policy responses which are adopted um, to um, the recession, so um, 
uh, initially, the countries um, try um, higher interest rates to stem um, capital inflow. Later on, they tend to adopt uh, more Keynesian stimulatory approaches to policy, um, and they all, to differing degrees, adopt um, uh, need to adopt policies of giving bailout loans to um, their banks. You can see the effect of um, the crisis on um, economic growth in each of the countries here. So you can see each of them with um, high rates of economic growth in the 10 years up to 1995. Again, relatively high growth in 1996. You can see um, slightly slower growth as the structural weaknesses start to become evident in Indonesia, Malaya and South Korea. And you can see a decline in the growth in GDP per capita in Thailand as it has to devalue its baht. You can see really, really major decreases in GDP per capita in these economies in 1998. So these are very large declines in, uh, in GDP per capita um, in these economies. You can see undoing the effect of um, at least the last couple of years of um, economic growth in most of these um, economies. But um, it, it ter this turns out to be a, a very um, sharp but relatively short term crisis in the economies. So you can see after 1998, the economies um, gradually recover to have growth rates sort of 4% in Thailand, 4% in Indonesia, um, around about 3 to 4% in Malaysia, and around about 4% in South um, Korea. So the Asian financial crisis, um, as distinct from um, the Japanese financial crisis, um, is a crisis that has a more short-lived um, effect on disturbing the trajectory of um, economic, economic growth. And there's a variety of reasons um, for that that include, for example, these economies um, not having some of the other structural factors that caused, so the demographic factors, for example, that caused um, the, the long run slowdown in growth in um, Japan. Um, one interesting perspective on this episode was the blame game. Um, who is to blame? Um, uh, so um, here I've got two of the protagonists in that um, debate. Uh, Mahathir Muhammad and George um, um, Soros. And um, Mahathir Muhammad um, uh, famously, um, here, uh, a quote from, the, from him um, uh, reproduced in Jeffrey Frieden's book, um, blamed George Soros. So George Soros, major international um, currency um, speculator, um, uh, the quote from Mahathir says, the poor people in these countries will suffer and these are the people who have to be protected from George Soros. So Mahathir was basically saying, look, this crisis came about because of um, currency um, speculation and um, George Soros is the um, person to um, blame. Um, now, in, in a literal sense, of course, it's true, as I explained, that the process of currency speculation um, was... Um, very important in explaining um, why um, this um, crisis um, occurred. And um, you could argue that if these countries had had um, restrictions on um, capital flows, restrictions on um, uh, international capital investment, that that would have been a, 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 an influence that um, mediated or, or reduced the extent to which um, there would have been those capital flows and the type of asset bubble which had occurred um, would, have, um, would, have, would have happened. Of course, you know, it's not only the international capital flow, it's about how that capital flow is used. And so it's not the capital flows per se, which of course bring um, significant um, benefits as well. We've seen um, historically the value of international capital flows in helping countries invest. It's about where the money gets invested. It's about um, the, um, the, the institutions, the processes in a country by which capital investment ends up being misdirected towards activities like real estate and poor um, investment projects. And so in that sense, um, some um, economic commentators have actually um, uh, perhaps circled the blame back on um, governments and politicians such as uh, Mahathir. So Raghuram Rajan in his book Fault Lines says a few governments contributed to the problem. Mahathir's vision was certainly of pharaonic, uh, pharaonic proportions. Um, and so Raghuram Rajan talks about um, government investment in huge public infrastructure projects, um, dams, um, airports, um, for example, um, which um, may not have had 
a high rate of return as being one source of the structural problems that underlay the um, inability to, um, or, or the, the, the investments that went bad in these countries. So uh, just a final point on some consequences. One point is that we can look at um, these four countries and actually develop from their differing experiences um, some knowledge about um, what caused the severity of recession and effects of policy in these um, different uh, um, countries. Um, so one, one example would be uh, Malaysia. So uh, Malaysia, for example, in the um, aftermath of the Asian um, financial um, crisis, imposed restrictions on um, capital outflows from Malaysia. And that meant that it was able to adopt a more stimulatory Keynesian um, type policy, which kept interest rates low, without worrying about um, that being offset by investors um, sending their money to other countries um, where um, they could where they could earn um, a, a higher rate of interest. Malaysia also had restrictions on the amount of foreign denominated debt that its banks could hold. Remember I mentioned that a major problem was with the financial crisis was that banks in these countries were holding um, had borrowed money that was denominated in US dollars and they hadn't hedged against that so that when their currencies depreciated, suddenly the value of their, their US dollar debts in terms of their own currencies was greatly inflated. Uh, Malaysia um, didn't allow um, those holdings of foreign denominated um, debt. And so that's one reason, uh, arguably one reason, why the severity of the Asian financial crisis wasn't as great in Malaysia as some of the other, uh, as the other countries that we looked at. Um, this episode did have a major um, adverse effect on well-being, even though, as I argued, it was sort of relatively short term compared to the slowdown in Japanese growth. The size of the episode was still sufficiently large to uh, dis have a major disturbing effect on economic activity, throw people um, out of work, you know, reduce significantly the economic well-being of a large proportion of population for an appreciable amount of time. There are political consequences. So the political leaders of Indonesia and Thailand um, were both, um, well, they were both forced to resign um, out of um, this episode. So economic instability here begetting um, political um, instability. And this episode cast both short and long shadows in its economic consequences for the rest of the world. So one thing is that there was um, a, a, a big a negative effect um, on demand for oil and hence on the price of oil, which caused significant problems in Russia in, in the short term. The longer term um, shadow, which really goes forward to the global financial crisis, was that fear of another crisis of this type occurring changed these countries in Asia from being net international borrowers to being net international lenders. So, so the fear of being exposed to uh, another crisis because of um, owing money to international borrowers really made these countries exceptionally cautious um, for the next decade about borrowing money and in fact turned them into being international lenders. And so it was these countries then together with, um, for example, um, China who were providing the capital inflow to the United States, which in some ways was repeating the mistakes of the Asian financial crisis, as we've talked about um, in an earlier section, an early, uh, in an earlier lecture, um, by then directing those capital inflows towards um, real, estate, um, real estate activity and creating a bubble um, in the housing uh, market. So this Asian financial crisis, it clearly is a very significant economic event in the countries where it occurred but also cast a shadow both in the short run and the long run um, to the rest of the world, making the point again about the degree of integration in the world economy today. In the next section of this lecture, I'll move on and talk about an Asian economy that I haven't talked about up until now in this lecture. I'll give a brief perspective on economic development in India. <laughs>